Okay, so let's start uh, our uh, today's uh, session uh, <clears throat> on uh, political representation in Brazil uh, as uh, the second part of our online series on uh, the 2022 presidential and parliamentary elections in Brazil, results and impacts. Last uh, week, we started with uh, winners and losers of the uh, elections and today we are going to talk about uh, political representation and uh, we have two uh, panelists uh, Bruno Wilhelm Speck and uh, Bruno Marquez Schäfer so the challenge will be to uh, not only say Bruno what do you think about it uh, but uh, we'll manage this. Um, before we start, I'd like to um, just very shortly uh, present our two speakers, starting with Bruno Wilhelm Speck. Uh, Bruno, since 1995, has engaged in research on good governance and corruption, campaign finance and political parties in Brazil and Latin America. He started off in Brazil as a professor of political science at Unicampi University in 1995. Uh, then he joined Transparency International as a consultant on comparative campaign finance regulation and national integrity systems uh, during 2003 to 2010. And since 2014, he is a professor of political science at USP, Universidade de São Paulo. Uh, Bruno has been a fellow researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law in Freiburg, Germany, at uh, Freie Universität Berlin and also at MIT in Boston. From 2019 to 2021, he was the editor-in-chief of the social science journal Revista Brasileira de Ciencias Sociais. Uh, then uh, the second panelist is Bruno Marquez Schäfer. Bruno has a PhD in political science and he is working uh, at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And his research focuses uh, in areas such as electoral funding, campaign financing, political parties, organizations, and public policy. And um, while I think she today is not able to join us, but uh, you will see later on that uh, his presentation is with uh, Professor Silvana Krause, also from uh, Federal uh, University of Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, even if she's not here today, I'd like to say a few words about her. Silvana Krause has a BA in Social Sciences from the uh, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, uh, a Master in Political Science from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, and a PhD in Political Science uh, from, from Katholische Universität Eichstadt in Germany. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to uh, pass uh, words to our first speaker today, and this will be Bruno Wilhelm Speck uh, from USP. Bruno. Uh, it's up to you now, please. Yes, thanks for this generous introduction. Hello to everybody. Uh, I would like to um, uh, talk briefly about four points uh, uh, concerning the political representation in Brazil, focusing obviously specifically on the on the recent election, but uh, going back in history. Uh, to show and illustrate what is specific about this election and what what uh, is a more historic trend. So I uh, first will look into uh, the question of electoral alliances and how they translate into uh, government alliances, building governments. Uh, then uh, I will look into uh, part of the question of party fragmentation, which is a kind of the structural uh, challenge uh, governments face when they try to build majorities. And third and fourth, I will look into the uh, role of leadership uh, in, in political uh, representation in Brazil, first looking at Bolsonaro and uh, the specifics of his electoral success and then into the um, 
uh, relationship between leaders in political parties more in general in Brazil. So it's a mix of uh, looking at what happens right now and into what we know and learn about political representation in Brazil. And I mean, uh, a kind of spoiler is that I cannot, uh, I do not come to really clear uh, conclusions. Um, it's more a, a, a mixed uh, uh, a mixed result about the specific challenges uh, about uh, Bolsonaro being uh, a very specific uh, political leader with very specific uh, political traits. Uh, but looking from a historical uh, perspective, he's le maybe less challenging, challenging or less threatening than we actually uh, think. So starting off with uh, the problem of translating electoral alliances into building government, governments. Now that's a basic challenge uh, of the current elected Lula government. No? Uh, he has to build a majority uh, coalition supporting his government. He has the PT has won, won 14 percent of the seats, and his other parties in his electoral alliance hold another 11 percent of the seats. So this uh, sums up to 20, 25 percent of the seats in the newly elected Congress, which is obviously half of the absolute majority. Uh, uh, necessary to support any government. Plus, the government frequently, uh, Brazilian governments frequently need to amend the constitution uh, due to the peculiar peculiarity of the Brazilian constitutional model that enshrined many public policies in the constitution. So many governments have to frequently amend the constitution and that requires a three fifth or 60% uh, of the votes in both houses. So it's not enough to have 50%. Typically, if you want to have a stable government in Brazil, you need 60% of the votes to amend the constitution. It's roughly three to five amendments per year. Uh, just to get roughly a uh, uh, size of the necessity uh, of changing the constitution frequently. Plus, that's the last plus, party loyalty in Brazil is not so strong. So this advises presidents to build alliances beyond what requires the majority of 50% or, or of 60%. So all this is to say there is a huge gap between the existing elected government's majority uh, of 25% of the votes and the ne necessary votes of 50, 60, or even 65% if we roughly translate what I said until now into numbers. So uh, this is the challenge of Lula. Now I'm gonna try to present something that this into historical perspective. Okay, so uh, this slide is just to show uh, the very same problem I uh, tried to picture of the Lula government now in a historical perspective. So we have all the elections since the redemocratization in the late 80s, uh, and we have um picture here picturing in greed in dark greed uh, in dark green uh the the percentage of votes of the president elect of his party huh? so that's his party it was Col government uh, colors party had roughly eight percent of the votes fernando enrique's party's psdb had 12 and then 19% uh, of those and so on. So no government party or no party of the elected uh, president had had more than 20% of the votes. And here we have Lula's party close to 14% of the votes. Okay. 
And the electoral alliance is the light green. So we can see here, uh, color added another 3% of the votes uh, with his two parties he allied with, allied, he, he ran the election with. Uh, Fernando Enrique was able to increase his vote share uh, significantly. Uh, Dilma also, uh, Lula less so now. If we now include our threshold, this makes maybe more sense. If we include the 50% threshold, we can see that only, th only three governments historically came out of the election with an absolute majority. Only three out of nine. Uh, only, um, actually, it's very close to only two Dilma's governments came out of the election with a 60% majority. Uh, and putting this, uh, putting Lula's recent uh, electoral success in perspective, we can see that his challenges or his challenge now in this election is very similar to his challenge in 2002 and 2006 and to the challenge of color and to the challenge of Fernando Enrique in his first election, which is to once being elected, start building a, an electoral alliance that goes, goes way beyond the parties that supported uh, his, um, his electoral success. So uh, seeing it from that perspective, what Lula faces now, he has faced twice in the past and, uh, and, well, and successfully faced so uh, and knowing that all these governments listed here were able to build stable majorities of 50% or more than 50%, uh, often 60% majorities, we can be relatively confident that uh, what Lula does now is something like business as usual, what happened uh, several times or what happened eight times before in Brazilian politics. So I would not be particularly worried about this challenge. The problem now is if we look into the structural problem that uh, produces this uh, um, this highly uh, fragmented party system, we also have to look at it from a historical perspective. So what political scientists try to uh, understand uh, for the last two, two decades as this uh, steep incline of the red and the blue line, the red line is that the absolute number of parties running for Congress in each year since 82. So we came, came from five to 12 to 19, then at a stable level, roughly 20 parties running for Congress uh, from the from the early 90s to the to 2010 and then another phase of steep incline from from 22 parties to 33 parties running for election uh, in the last election and if we translate this in the indicator that is more accepted by political scientists the effective number of parties we have a similar uh, development, a steep incline initially, then a phase of stagnation, and then another incline from the 2010 to 2018. Now, this was uh, mainly explained, explained by institutional incentives. Uh, we political scientists said that uh, there are several reasons why political parties uh, in Brazil tend to fr fragment uh, uh, more and more, it was once uh, from once linked to the proportional system of representation, and then to a number of institutional incentives uh, that even increased the fragmentation. So, uh, one incentive was the um, uh, the lack of any threshold that uh, threatens or inhibits political parties to uh, get 
representation below a certain percentage of votes. So that didn't exist in Brazil. And it was also the uh, existence of a number of ways to work around the existing effective uh, threshold by the district magnitude. So basically political parties were able to circumvent uh, diff the difficulty of getting representation by uh, uh, building electoral alliances during the uh, election of the of Congress. So they, they uh, built alliances and uh, even small parties got elected. Now what happened now uh, in this election is this last very sh uh, sharp drop of both the number of parties running and the number of if the effective numbers uh, a number of parties uh, getting representation in congress and uh, now that what what happened uh, uh, the explanation is again uh, a change in the institutional environment so basically two changes happened uh, once again by an, a constitutional amendment approved in two, 2017. Uh, sorry, 2017, exactly. So one uh, was the introduction of a threshold for parties not to get representation, but to access public funding for political parties. So from 2020, 2020 were local elections and for national elections from 2022 onwards, political parties that do not meet 1.5% of the votes uh, in 2002 will not get public funding in the future. And this threshold will increase up to 3% step by step 3% entering into force in 2032, 10 years from now. It seems to be a far shot, but um, the, the, from the existing parties, 23 would miss the mark of 3% entering into force in 32. So two thirds of the party would not receive public funding 10, 10 years from now uh if they cannot increase their electoral performance so that was one institutional change not preventing parties from getting representation but preventing parties from getting uh, public funding which is quite important and bruno uh, will talk about this later and the second change was that the uh, electoral alliances alliances for running for a federal deputy were prohibited. So the parties were no longer able to circumvent the difficulty of getting elected uh, by in, in states with a low district magnitude. So this seems very specific and very long-term and very, uh, very uh, abstract, but it had a huge impact as we can see it had a huge impact on our uh, system, on Brazil's political system of political representation. And we can expect that in the future, the number of parties and the effective number of political parties represented even will uh, uh, drop more. Uh, uh, if we imagine that the threshold now is at 1.5% and caused a deep impact, we can project that in the future, in the next 10 years, step by step, the number of political parties will be reduced in Brazil. So this is a very uh, important change in the structure of political representation in Brazil. Now, well, since I've already talked for 15 minutes, I will uh, uh, rapidly change now to my second uh, subject, which is talking about the Bolsonaro uh, effect and what Bolsonaro meant and what he meant in a historical perspective. So we already know that uh, uh, Bolsonaro was quite a phenomenon. Um, 
not being taken serious in the first uh, election in 2018 until a couple of months uh, uh, before the election. Then obviously winning the election and winning again this time at least uh, a considerable number or, or share of the votes. Bolsonaro being an outsider, this has been uh, something quite spectacular uh, in Brazil. And the degree of uh, spectacularness uh, uh, we can see at this historical map of how outsiders performed in the Brazilian context. So we had our first outsider uh, appeared uh, at the first electoral, uh, at the first presidential election in 89, and he won the election called uh, uh, Colo, Colo de Melo at that time. And I have not, um, uh, I have not shared the vote share of uh, the president's vote, but I uh, included here the vote share of the party the president ran for. Uh, so Collor ran for the PRN, an unknown party before him and an unknown party after him. But uh, he managed to increase the vote share of this party from zero, non-existent, to 8.3% uh, at the election uh, immediately at that time. The election was not uh, at the same time, but a year after his election, his party managed to gather 8.3% of the votes. That was uh, the, the that was an enormous uh, uh, success for for a newly created party, which was not repeated since then. So Ineas Carneiro, another uh, outsider running for president in the same election. He was able to gather about 7% of the vote himself, but was only able to translate uh, his votes into less than 1% of uh, the votes for the party he ran for, for the Prona party. So this shows Collor was quite uh, a success for his party also. Ciro Gomez, which is well, a well-known politician, changed several times the party. So he ran twice for a new party, and was what was able to increase roughly only a percent, less than a percent in 89, in 98, and a little more than 1% of vote share for his party in the election in 2018. So he's a, a success maybe for himself, but he's not able to translate votes into uh, an increase of votes, uh, votes for the party he ran for. Eloisa Elena, another part, uh, another uh, successful uh, presidential candidate, was also able to gather to increase the vote share of the PSOL party by 1.2 percent. So, having said this, we clearly see that Bolsonaro running for a party PSL in 2018, and again running for another party uh, in 2022 has increased the vote share of the first of the in the previous election has increased the vote share of PSL by more than 10 percent and again by more than 10 percent in 2022 the vote share of the PL so from this historic perspective the capacity of Bolsonaro not only to uh, once win and then barely uh, miss Oscar uh, uh, running a very close election, uh, he was able not only to have success for himself, but also to produce votes for, for the party he ran for. So this is a kind of uh, worrisome or uh, a perspective that may be pre preoccupying uh, uh, for ourselves if we look at or if we speculate about what happens next after he lost the election. What will be his, his role in the future uh, uh, Congress and in the future uh, representation of political interests? Uh, going one step further, um, we can now ask how the electorate in general re reacts to political leaders 
and to um, uh, and to political parties, where lies the loyalty of the Brazilian electoral uh, electorate if they are faced to follow leaders or political parties, um, and if they are confronted with the split between leaders and political parties. I first compared here uh, the, the election of governors. The number of elections for presidents are simply not enough to uh, pose this question. So if we asked, what, do, what does the electorate do when political leaders in two consecutive elections run for the, for the same party or for a different party? Uh, and we compare the vote share of the first and the sec second election. So comparing the elections of more than 1,000 governors that ran from 1998 to 2022, uh, we, uh, we, can come, we come to the conclusion that if the governor runs for the same party again, on average, he loses or she loses half percent of the vote. If the governor runs for a different party in the next election, which is this, can you see my, my mouse? Okay, so if the party runs for a different, uh, if the governor runs for a different party and the party runs with a different leader for governor also, so the two part partners of the first election confront each other, both lose if compared to the previous election, but the party, the blue, uh, loses more than the leader. So if confronted with the choice of choosing between the leader of the pre previous election and the party of the previous election, the, the electorate follows the leader and punishes the party. Now, if, and these are the two last um, numbers here, if only the party runs with a different leader, the previous uh, candidate for governor uh, drops out, or if only the leader runs with a different party and if the previously running party drops out of the race, of the next race, the leader actually, on average, wins 1.5% of the vote and the party loses 1.9% of the vote. So what's the conclusion here? You can say uh, the uh, uh, running again on the same ticket uh, brings in roughly the same amount of the votes. There is a small drop, but uh, it's roughly the same uh, percentage of the votes. If only the party runs compared with the situation where only the candidate runs, the candidate performs better than the party. And if both the party and the candidate runs, the electorate follows, all, punishes both, but punishes less the candidate and more the party. So roughly we can conclude that looking at the governor's races, the electorate uh, is very strongly oriented towards the leaders, not, not necessarily towards the parties. And just wrapping up and finishing, if we, if we do the same uh, with the mayor's races now, now we have a base of more than 70,000 cases, the results are roughly the same. Huh? So uh, this is, uh, I would say, I. Would conclude here just not to exceed too much my time now. 38, I've already talked more than 20 minutes, but I can add some words on uh, that in our discussion. Thanks a lot, Bruno. And uh, now I would like to hand over to our second Bruno today, uh, Bruno Schaefer. Okay, thank you, Peter. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bruno Schaeffer, uh, and today I, I present a brief reflection on electoral funding in Brazil in the spirit of these talks. So, uh, 
Uh, electron funding can be seen as a market relationship uh, in which uh, we have supply and demand. And this analogy is not new, but is useful. So on the demand side, we cons can consider candidates and parties that are resource dependent to be elected. And the mechanisms that link one thing to another can be diverse, but we have to keep in mind that money is important. And in the case of candidates, uh, in so many senses. So uh, on the supply side, we have the resources that are legally available to parties and candidates, both at the time of elections and day-to-day -day political work. Therefore, we have supply and demand, a market in which resources uh, are in demand and have specific sources of donors. Uh, in the Brazilian cases, uh, changes in the regulation of electoral and party funding have been a reaction, as Bruno Speck uh, also put in a, a paper, reaction to unexpected events or crises. And above all, supply regulation. So until 1993, uh, Brazilian legislation on political funding, electoral funding, uh, prohibit corporate donations to party or candidates. Uh, the scandal that followed the election of Fernando Collor de Mello led to a new law. The realization that the president's campaign uh, then already removed from office by impeachment, had to use corporate resources to get elected and was a catalyst for the Brazilian legislative to change the law, allowing corporate donations. Uh, since then, there's been new legislation on parties in 19, 1995, allowing corporate donations to these organizations and in 1997, again, a new law now specific to elections. So from 1993 to two, uh, 2015, on the supply side uh, to parties and candidates, private resources are allowed from companies, individuals, and self-financing. Uh, and public resources through the Fundo Partidário, Party Fund. With this configuration, the main share of resources for elections came from companies. Uh, not only companies, but a few number of companies. According to data collected by Wagner Mancuso, 70% uh, of the resources used uh, in electoral campaigns came from contributions by companies and some uh, specific economic sectors, such as uh, construction. Uh, the companies donated to the candidates uh, directly and to the parties, and then these organizations mediated the resource distribution. So uh, the relationship between the supply of resources to campaigns and demand uh, can generate a, ser a series of problems when it's based on certain promiscuity. For example, the exchange of favors between donors and political agents. The team is complex and subject to regulation around the world. And we saw here uh, how problematic it was. In Brazil, the option again was to regulate, uh, was the regulation of supply. In 2015, a decision by the Federal Supreme Court, uh, Supremo Tribunal Federal, STF, declared corporate donations to campaigns and parties unconstitutional in the wake of Lava Jato operation. The consequence on the one hand was the reinforcement of other sources such as candidates self-financing, individuals donations, but mainly the increase of public resources for electoral campaigns. In the first case, where we already saw in 2016, the election of self-financed candidates such as João Doria, uh, mayor, of Sao Paulo. The second is the donation of businessmen who now started to transfer resources via CPF as legal persons and not CNPJ as companies. And finally, the third, uh, the increase in the party fund and the creation of the electoral fund. 
Today we see that the electoral funding model of Brazilian politics continue, continues to be mixed, that is private and public resources, but now uh, without the contributions of companies and greater participation of the state. Uh, public resources are destined to the parties at the national level and their national committees have the autonomy to distribute the resources to the candidates that they want. In this plot, we can see the resources allocated by the parties to the candidates for the Chamber of Deputies or the lower house of the National Congress uh, represented 44% in 2014. Of this value, the vast majority came from companies. In 2018, the resources of the parties represent 78% of the total the most uh, public money. And in 2022, this election, this percentage uh, will reach almost 89%. Almost every real uh, in the campaign was from the public budget. That is, uh, parties become, over time, the major mediators of electoral funding. However, until 2014, this funding was from companies, and today it's, it came from state. Supply regulation did not uh, fall with the same weight uh, on demand. On this side of the relationship are candidates and parties. Camp cam campaigns are expensive around the world, but in Brazil, they can be even more expensive for several reasons, such as the electoral system and uh, the size of the district. A candidate for uh, for the federal deputy, for example, disputes the election by running against candidates from other parties besides his colleagues, given the aspect of the open list, in uh, an entire state, which is the electoral district. The main measure to try to reduce the number of resources in recent years was the establishment of spending caps for campaigns in 2015. This measure uh, reduced the resources need to be elected, but uh, improvements are still needed. Between 2014 and 2018, the number of resources decreased, but grew again in 2022. And in the difference between uh, the elected and not elected and non-elected members of the Chamber of Deputies was maintained through this time. On average, elected candidates raise six uh, reais per voter, while non-elected candidates collected less than one uh, real per voter in the in the state. In this plot, uh, the blue bo box plots represent the elected federal deputies and the red ones the defeated. In all sources, whatever companies, individuals, self-financing or party resources, we have extreme inequality in the distribution of money. A Gini index closer to one. Overall, however, inequality fell slightly in 2018 and above all in 2022 with some important changes in the legislation, mainly in the case of resources distributed by parties. So before uh, the 2018 election, for example, the Supreme Court understanding of the allocation of resources to women candidates changes. Now parties must distribute at least 30% of resources to female candidates, while already in 2020, there is an understanding that party resources for black candidates should be proportional to the member of candidates from this group in the party. So in the case of uh, female candidates in this plot, we can see that the uh, average part resources rise uh, from uh, 2010, 2014 through the next period, uh, decreasing the gap between uh, female and male candidates in, in the case of party resources. Not by chance, there is a growth in the number of uh, women elected federal deputies 
but still it's a very small number. In 2022, for example, only uh, 18 of the Chamber of Deputies are women. For black candidates, uh, the gap remains between the, the two periods. Uh, blue line in this plot, uh, which we require further explanation from the political science. So the Brazilian case compared to other countries presents some particular characteristics. In the case of company donations, Brazil is part of a minority group that prohibits these groups from directly uh, participating in the electoral funding. According to data from IDEA, uh, Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, most co countries do not prohibit companies from contributing to parties or candidates. Uh, in the case of public funding, Brazil is in the majority uh, group. Most countries foresee that a portion of their budget must be allocated to parties and or electoral campaigns. The difference in Brazil is the amount of these resources. In 2000. Uh, 22, there were more than 5 billion reais, more than the uh, some <laughs> some uh, ministries, as well as the, the dependence on these values. Brazilian parties survive almost exclusively on public funds uh, since uh, the party fund and electoral fund. Since 2015, on average, more than 90. Uh, percent of all the that the parties raise came from the federal government budget. The number is also frightening when we consider that in Brazil more than 10 percent of the voters are members of a political party. However, few donated to these organizations. It's also necessary to consider how these values are distributed. That is where uh, that is where the legislation comes in. The national committees of the parties have discretionary power and enormous freedom to determine how these resources will be distributed. It's also important uh, to consider that I deal here with the legal, uh, the legal resources that circulate in the campaigns. That is, they are declared in the uh, electoral court, the PSE. Although these values tell a story of Brazilian elections, they do not tell the whole history. Other resources can be considered in the analysis. In the case of the Chamber of Deputies, the secret budget, or Samente Secreto, a form of pork uh, barrel without transparency available to deputies, represent 16 billion reais in 2022. Uh, the deputies with the highest amounts of this type of resource were in the vast majority re-elected in this election. Uh, finally, the, uh, the data on this relation must be available to the population. The normative angle here is important, but we also have to pay attention to the effect of any reform uh, in Brazil, we are experiencing a reformist anxiety that, end, uh, that ends up crowning out changes, nor do we expect one change to take effect to produce another and more. The problem we see is that uh, the political system is experiencing a crisis of le legitimacy, that is, the elector does not trust or evalu evaluate well its representatives, Measures such as the addition of public resources tend to not help this assessment. However, we don't know we don't we sorry we do not know to what extent electoral funding is an issue for this electorate. More research is needed in this area. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bruno. And. Uh, well, now we have uh, time for your questions, for comments, and um, there are different possibilities to participate uh, in the discussion. You can uh, raise your electronic hand. Um, you can, of course, also, and you are all invited 
to uh, turn on your uh, video if you would like to. Then you can raise also your uh, physical hand. And of course, it's also possible to uh, write your question in the chat. I would like to start with uh, questions for each of our Brunos today. I, I found this really uh, very interesting and um, astonishing. And my first question for Bruno Speck would be, uh, you said that uh, the challenge for uh, Lula now to to manage uh, or to, to get into turns and forming a governing alliance is uh, could could be uh, characterized as uh, some kind of business as usual because he already knows this challenge uh, at least from 2002 and we all know that he also is a very uh, good uh, coordinator and he knows how to form alliances. Now, given this, I would like to know how do you consider the changes, the enormous changes and the number of effective parties in parliament? What uh, consequences might this have for uh, alliance building? Does it make it easier or does it make it more difficult? Because this in some way means also that if you only have uh, 9.9 .9 instead of 23 effective uh, number of parties or what was it 18 instead of 33 parties in parliament so uh, this in some way means that um, each of these parties is uh, in some way uh, more important than the parties before no uh, and, and so what are the consequences of this situation for the forming of, for the building of governing alliances? And uh, Bruno Schäfer, I would like to ask you, um, what are the consequences uh, of the fact that, as you said, parties have transformed into the most important mediators for electoral funding, uh, and what does this mean for uh, for the power of the political parties? Does it make uh, them more powerful also with regard to individual candidates? Or how do we have to, to understand this? Perhaps we should start uh, with uh, Bruno Speck and then uh, Bruno Schäfer. And uh, as I said, all of you are invited to uh, to participate in the discussion. Bruno. Thank you so much. Um, I think the number of parties, uh, I, it's not what I say, it's what Satori once famously, famously said, the more, num the, the, the higher number uh, of parties in Congress, the more complex are negotiations. So if you have a large number of uh, parties, it's extremely complex to negotiate stable uh, government. Uh, and uh, the uh, with just a, f uh, a few or uh, with the number of parties dropping to half, the, the possibility of forming a stable government, in my opinion, is higher and it's much easier to negotiate. Uh, if you have to negotiate with parties that represent only one or two or three uh, deputies, uh, it's it's enormously complex to make concessions to these uh, small parties. You, you cannot give them a ministry, you cannot give them too much, but they need a, sm a small share of participation of votes. So I guess uh, it's easier uh, if you negotiate with just a few parties and the parties are very powerful players, but maybe Bruno wants to respond to that. The parties are very powerful players in Congress because they can put a price tag on on their on the on the, on representatives who behave uh, uh, disloyal. So they can uh, punish them by not appoint, appointing them to. Uh, commissions uh, to the committees to uh, uh, or give them or 
um, they can punish them in, in a, a number of ways. Uh, and one of the new ways to punish them, but that would probably be an argument of Bruno's now, one of the new ways of punishing them is to, uh, uh, to um, not to give them access to the public funding that comes through the party headquarters. So in the past, parties uh, had some leverage over uh, uh, deputies because they could give them some funding, uh, but the main part of the campaign finance funding for deputies came from private funding sources, from companies. Deputies were able, or candidates were able, or were unable to have access to private funding. Now every cent comes through the party. So the party has now an absolute power uh, over the campaign financing of possible candidates in any election. So that gives the parties a very powerful position towards their future representatives, which uh, once again makes it easier to negotiate with party leaders representing just a few parties than negotiating with a large number of party uh, leaders in Congress. Thank you, Bruno. And uh, the other Bruno, you have the word. So thank you for the, the question. Uh, yes, uh, I think in the first view, uh, parties as mediators of electoral funding could be a uh, good news because uh, with more money or more control of the money, they can uh, put their members, candidates in line. But uh, we have other mechanisms that the candidates, uh, the individual candidates can, could uh, uh, pass, uh, pass the parties, so, such as the, we have uh, a, a very, uh, uh, a very Brazilian thing that is the janela partidária, the uh, party window, six months before the election, that uh, the candidates could migrate from other party without losing the, their mandate. So they they could uh, negotiate directly directly with other party uh, uh, for more money or other things. Uh, we have also the Orçamento Secreto, the secret budget, a form of pork barrel that uh, individual deputies could uh, uh, could use in the, the Chamber of Deputies. And also, uh, I do not know how much uh, more control of the money represents more control of the of the individual candidates because we also have a series of problems in internal democracy and the, who decides where the money goes is the national committee of the parties and they are very uh, small and with the same leaders uh, for many years. So I, I don't know how actually this could improve uh, democracy in Brazil. But yeah, uh, as, as the first view, uh, we can see that parties uh, are now more powerful in the relationship with the candidates. Um, Bruno, let me just um, ask you two more questions um, based on, you, on what you just said. The first, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the Janela Partidaria, uh, the party window. Um, this uh, before was the possibility to to change party after elections. But if I uh, got it right now, this this change. So how does it work now? This would be my first question. And the second one, uh, as you mentioned, the issue of internal. Uh, party democracy and 
uh, problems of uh, dem uh, internal democracy within parties. I would like to know um, whether the um, the Brazilian state uh, didn't think about combining in some way uh, the electoral financing with demands uh, with regard to internal party democracy, because as it seems uh, to to me now, there uh, is a lot of money that, that goes to political parties, and but this could also be a possibility for the legislator, for the state, to uh, well to say, okay, uh, we are going to uh, have this public uh, uh, electoral financement, and uh, this is an indirect party financing also. But um, if you want to, if you want to have this money, you also have to show uh, some signs of uh, well more party democracy, internal democracy. Uh, so. This would be my two questions. Okay, uh, let me try to answer. <laughs> uh, sorry about my English. Uh, I expect that you can understand what I'm saying. Of course, of course. Uh, so the Janela Partidaria party window is uh, happens six months before the election. The all the the. Uh, the representatives in any level could change the party in one month without losing the the uh, mandate. So, if you are a deputy in the uh, in the chamber of deputies, you have one month uh, in the six months before the election to change uh, to your party without any risk of losing your position because in the rest of the time uh, uh, the electoral justice understanding is that the mandate uh, uh, are uh, the mandate uh, mandata do partido né agora pedi uma tradução aqui por favor pertains pertains to the party pertains yes thank you uh, in the second question of the internal democracy, uh, 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 according to the federal constitution, the article 17, uh, parties have the autonomy to organize themselves uh, and it's not very clear if this autonomy uh, embarks everything. So, very a, a lot of specialists uh, say that this not uh, this autonomy is not a uh, hundred is not a hundred percent autonomy because, as you say, public resources that we have a several of rules that if you if you, we can use it. So, uh, yeah, the legislators could be <laughs> could be more creative in this sense but uh, the, the legislators are also party members and are also par, uh, members of the national committees of the parties so uh, they are not going to uh, sacrifice their autonomy in the use of money in recent years we have uh, a lot of uh, 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 so, uh, amnesty, amnesty to the misuse of public resources in the National Congress. So we have a problem that the legislators are the same. Um, the the separation of uh, party in the public office in the central office in Brazil is very narrow in many parties. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruno Speck, would you like to add something to uh, these questions? Um, yes, maybe a note on, uh, still a concluding note on, on the question of Bolsonaro, because in a certain way, um, 
the picture I painted uh, was that Bolsonaro is a very powerful leader. He's able to translate, uh, translate his personal leadership into party votes. And the Brazilian electorate is quite susceptible uh, to party leaders, more so when, when, confl when, when conflicted between party and candidate, uh, they tend to uh, follow the candidate. So that would be a personal leader and he produces votes, but he is very incapable of leading, uh, uh, of dealing with uh, the political party landscape and with the necessity uh, of uh, uh making concessions to the political parties for example uh one of the first moments when he failed to further build a party uh, that supports his government was in the local elections two years ago uh, he tried to build his own party to form an old bar uh, an own party um and he failed so because he was unable to meet the requirements. The requirements were relatively high, they're relatively complex, organizationally complex. You have to gather the vote of roughly half of a million of voters, which should be easy for somebody who just won more than 50, 50 million votes two years ago. No? So he had to gather the votes uh, or the the, the uh, the support of half a million of voters and build an organization in at least nine states. So you had to have a regional presence, but he was unable to do so, or maybe unwilling, but unable to do so. And that was the first time when, from, from my opinion, he showed that he would not be able to build his own electoral base for his re-election. So he had to find a new party uh, to, uh, to support or to give, um, to give him um, uh, so the support for, for running for a new election, for, for his re-election. So he entered the PL uh, party. And the PL party, the Liberal Party, is a party uh, uh, whose leader was able to control the party even when he was in prison. So he was in prison uh, for a couple of years and he was able to, to maintain his party leadership uh, during his time in prison. And uh, he probably, uh, now Bolsonaro is in his party and he would have to have some control over the Liberal, liberal Party in order to uh, guide or to uh, uh, build a stable opposition from the leadership within the Liberal Party. But Bolsonaro basically did nothing right now showing that he is able to lead within the party. So he has, he, he has not uh, gained the presidency or he has not gained the uh, any significant position within the party that would guarantee uh, that he has some kind of control and leadership in a future in the future opposition against Lula. So I would say uh, Bolsonaro Bolsonaro is very capable of communicating directly with the voter, but he is very incapable of dealing with the Brazilian landscape of political parties, of negotiate, negotiating within parties, of taking hold of political parties to build a stable opposition. He was unable to do so while he was in government. And he, from my opinion, will continue to be unable to use the party system to build a stable opposition within parliament, at least. Now, he might be able to mobilize opposition without parliament, next to parliamentary opposition. That communication with the voter, he showed he is capable to. But inside parliament and inside Congress, he uh, will probably not be able to lead the opposition against the Lula government in a cohesive, in a cohesive and coherent way. Uh, but let me 
just insist a little bit more in this issue because uh, Bolsonaro is so contradictory in, as I, I see it because he started his um, presidential mandate in 2018 Uh, telling everybody, well, I'm not gonna continue with this Brazilian corrupt, uh, uh, how is it, um, um, ne 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 negotiating uh, presidentialism, parliamentary uh, um, presidentialism, I, I will not negotiate with uh, parties in Congress because this is, uh, this equals corruption. But then after two years, he got it quite clearly that he uh, would have to win uh, some more support, uh, at least from the uh, leaders, uh, the speakers uh, of the House and of the Senate, because if not, he would have risked impeachment. Huh? And so he, uh, he managed to build some alliances within both chambers. Uh, but Uh, what we are seeing now uh, during the last weeks, and this refers to the other aspect, uh, his, uh, as you said, his skills to uh, be a public uh, leader, but he has been quite mute now the last, uh, during the last weeks, he has hardly shown in public, he has uh, spoken little, and uh, so uh, this is very contradictory um, uh, at least for me, it, it, it seems to be very contradictory. Um, how, how would you interpret this? And if, of course, if, uh, if Bruno Schäfer wants to say something uh, about this also, you're invited, no? Um, yes, I mean, we know very, or at least I know very little about the dynamics uh, of a populist leader uh, Uh, or of this specific populist leader out of government. We learned about Bolsonaro as a populist leader while he was in government or while he was at least in his last, in his last uh, month before the first election and in government. But we don't know him out of government. So basically what you uh, said about his uh, his change of mind in the second half of his government uh, getting into a more conciliatory uh, uh, negotiation position uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with Congress, that was born more out of fear of getting impeached than of actually a change of mind in terms of instrumentalizing or using governments uh, and the, the cooperation with the government, uh, sorry, the cooperation with Congress Uh, for a propositional uh, purpose in terms of public policies. No? He did not use uh, cooperation with uh, uh, Congress to promote his agenda, to promote his political agenda. It was merely a protective cooperation. No? So he needed uh, Congress not to get impeached. But I, I would say, I'm, I mean, right now, I'd say he's, he will also not be too capable of leading uh, as a populist leader out of not being in charge anymore. No? But that might be too optimistic. Uh, but I'm quite sure that he will not be the uh, opposition leader in Congress because he's in, uh, for that you need some skills that have to do with knowing uh, the party landscape and knowing how to control a political party or a group of political parties. And he, he has shown he's unable to do that in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Bruno Schäfer, you put it in the chat, Residencialismo de Coalizar, de coalizar no? the uh, coalition presidentialism, that's it. Thank you. Um, would you like to say something about uh, The issue, or oh, you got lost now? Uh, or no, you... uh, I'm here, uh, oh, but okay. I don't know what happened with my oh. camera. Oh, I think that uh, Bruno was very kind when he said that Bolsonaro had a, an agenda. I think that he doesn't uh, never had a, a clear agenda, uh, and I don't know. Uh, 
My and impression I think that... always was that he he knew what he wanted to destroy. Yes. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether he uh, had real alternatives. Uh, well, back to the past, no. But uh, destroy uh, a lot of uh, what has been reformed by not only by the uh, by the PT, but uh, even by the Cardoso governments, no, because all this uh, has been considered as the leftist by by him. Uh, but yeah, uh, his his uh, economy minister said that every government since the constitution was le uh, left government, even color. So even color. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't. <laughs> uh... I think that was a, a destruction government against the the constitution, against the federal constitution and all the social rights and political rights that uh, it represents. But uh, I, I I agree with Bruno uh, uh, that he is not going to be uh, the oppositional leader uh, in institutional terms because he's not capable of uh, anything in the institution uh, in the institutional landscape so I think that will be uh, some uh, conflict in the right wing with, uh, with several candidates of the oppositional leader uh, the, the Lula oppositional leader the the government of my state, Rio Grande do Sul, elected by the Social Democratic uh, Social Democracy Party (PSDB), has already said that he gonna be uh, Lula's opposition. So there's a lot of con candidates for this position. Mm -hmm. um, the relationship uh, between the future government and Congress will will also be an issue. Uh, in uh, one of our next sessions now in, in January uh, that will be entirely on, on government and Congress relations. Uh, as today we are talking about political representation, I would like to uh, to issue uh, to, to make another uh, question uh, and th that is referred to uh, something at least in Germany has been uh, um, well not discussed a lot but uh, so the the different caucuses in the uh, Brazilian Congress the Bible caucus the evangelic caucus the the um, the agricultural and the gun caucus and I would like to ask you whether you have some information about if there have been changes, if we compare the 2018 elections and the uh, 2022 elections, whether these groups uh, will um, have a comparable uh, representation within the um, in, within both chambers of Congress, or whether there have been uh, significant changes with regard to evangelicals, uh, gun caucus, uh, and agricultural caucus? Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether we have already any results on that, uh, but I guess our next uh, week's presentation will deal with uh, security and uh, uh, with uh, the question of political representation of, of uh, security uh, forces in, in Congress. Mm -hmm. So maybe Okay. But I'm I'm not aware of any research at all, Rezi, or or any publication that already uh, takes stock of what changed uh, from the past to the next mm -hmm. Congress. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, we have a preliminary report from the JAPI uh, on the on these caucuses uh, and. Uh, what they report is that uh, the size of the caucuses didn't change much between two elections, but uh, the uh, the leaders maybe change because uh, the Bible caucus, the agriculture caucus, they all uh, converge more 
with the same leaders. So uh, a policeman uh, is from, uh, he will be the, from uh, the evangelical caucus, the security caucus and the agriculture caucus. So we have more uh, interconnection between these, the leaders of this, these groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have one last question, uh, and I'm looking, but I don't see any raised hand, so I I will ask you uh, this question. It, it refers to the um, Orsamento Secreto. Mm -hmm. During the electoral com campaign, Lula said that he would uh, end this uh, Orsamento Secreto. Uh, now, in the last weeks, it seems that he will not be able to uh, really stop this kind of uh, financing. That is always also a huge challenge uh, because uh, we are, this is always um, also put into uh, some relationship uh, with corruption, so how 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 do you interpret uh, the current situation with regard to the uh, the current situation and also the future of the Orsamento Secreto? Will it continue, uh, or how do you see this? Well, I can give it a start. Um... I think, first of all, I think today is the day when the Supreme Court uh, would decide on part of the legality or uh, constitutionality of the Orsamento Secreto. And if it's not today, uh, uh, the Supreme Court at some point will take a decision. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, uh, tomorrow, okay. So we will, maybe the political elite will uh, be in the privileged position of being able to outsource uh, this problem to the Supreme Court. And once again, the Supreme Court will hopefully take uh, 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 a decision in favor of a more transparent uh, solution. If not, uh, Lula will have a hard time to negotiate on one side his, as I showed, uh, uh, necessity of a 50 or 60 or more percent of supporting Congress, Congress and at the same time, cutting down on uh, certain privileges of, of the Congress. Now, uh, just another note on uh, what the Orsament Secreto, the Supreme Budget uh, means. Now, in theory, it's not immediately uh, connected to corruption because the uh, secret, secret budget means that uh, more privileged positions uh, in, the, in Congress allow for more discretion about how the public budget will be allocated and executed. So it's not immediately linked to uh, to corrupt to corruption. Eh? It's more about the distribution of the discretionary power to allocate the budget. Now in practice it's said to be linked to corruption and we know little about it because it's not very transparent uh, and we we don't do not have much data to to uh, examine uh, so that's my second comment about what the secret budget act actually means it's about the discretionary the distribution of the discretionary power uh, in congress on how to allocate the budget and it can be more democratic more equally distributed which has been the case from, from the mid 90s until today. And it can be more uh, elite oriented, giving much of this power of discretionary dis distribution to the leader, for example, uh, of, uh, of the Congress. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, Bruno Schaeffer, you'd like to add something? Uh, uh, I agree with... Uh... Bruns back and I also say that uh, uh, one of the, the problems uh, with the secret budget is that uh, 
is not uh, is not uh, equal as the other pork barrel uh, measures in Congress, uh, but also the I don't think that uh, it's going to end uh, the secret budget, but maybe more uh, it's going to be more transparent in the future, so we can actually see the the data and could measure uh, uh, the allocation of this money okay so we are running out of time uh, and uh, so i would like i think we have had a really interesting uh, discussion today i learned a lot and uh, so i would like to uh, thank uh, you uh, two uh, once again uh, for the presentations and also for the discussion and uh, like to invite everybody to join us next week when we are going to talk about domestic politics and social movements before entering a, a Christmas break and then uh, continuing in January already with uh, a new president uh, and then there will be three more sessions uh, on government and congress government and judiciary and the last uh, but not least one on foreign policy and international relations so thank you very much bruno wilhelm speck and bruno schaefer and hope uh, hoping to see everybody uh, once again next week Thanks a lot.